This is the Sports Bash Warm-Up with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN. Now, live inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, here's Josh Hennig. The fact that the Sixers were unable to re-sign Jimmy Butler, were unable to sign J.J. Raddick, uh, I felt as though their best season was last season, um, particularly because of the way they were able to move Ben Simmons off the basketball. Uh, because he, he's so tall and because he has court vision, I think sometimes the elasticity of what he can do gets lost in translation, and he, and he can score it at will. That was Brandon Robinson here on the warm-up a couple days ago here on 97.3 ESPN. As the NBA takes more steps toward resuming their season Our conversation turns back to the basketball court. Text board is open for you, 609-403-0973. Adrian Wojnarowski tweeted an hour ago that among the teams left out of the Orlando resumption, some members of NBA's Board of Governors disagree with the 22-team format, but do plan to cast a yes vote on the call. The call was scheduled for 12.30 Eastern. All reports are there's the expectation that the 22-team plan for Orlando will pass and the NBA will be taking more steps toward resuming their season. Josh Hennick here on the warm-up on 97.3 ESPN. 609-403-0973 is the text board. Coming up at 125, we'll talk more NBA and Sixers with Brian Toporek from Bleach Report and the NBA pod as well. But as Brendan uh, Robinson said the other day here on the warm-up on 97.3 ESPN, he felt that the Sixers' best team was last year's team. He believes that if Ben Simmons was not the primary ball handler, if you took the ball out of his hands, you would have the opportunity for him to focus more on scoring. And then he believes Ben Simmons, as a scorer, can score whenever he wants. I find that belief intriguing because, first of all, we've been saying here on 97.3 ESPN for at least a year, multiple of us, myself, Mike Gill, and others, We've all asked the question about, should Ben Simmons be the point guard? Should Ben Simmons be the primary ball handler? Does he need another guy with him? We saw Jimmy Butler last year, right? And I brought up multiple times about the idea of, look at the 90s. And look at the early 2000s. Guys like Scottie Pippen and Grant Hill. Two guys who were technically forwards but they were primary ball handlers as forwards. And while those teams had traditional point guards, just in the structure of their height and their placement on the floor, I don't think anybody would have told Scotty or Grant, stop handling the ball, stop dishing out assists, because that was part of their skill set. When Tracy McGrady went to Orlando and then later Houston, He was technically a shooting guard slash small forward, but he was a guy who also was a ball handler. So while he played with traditional point guards, he was still the guy dishing out assists, bringing the ball up the floor at least half, if not more, of the time. You look at the Warriors' offense. Steph Curry is technically the point guard. But Draymond Green is another ball handler. And there are times that he is either bringing the ball up the floor or Curry brings the ball up the floor and passes to Draymond. And Draymond is the one initiating the offense. There is a strong possibility that, as Brandon Robinson said on Tuesday's show, last year's Sixers just may have been the better team. And part of it may have had to do something with the fact that Ben Simmons had the ball taken out of his hands. Now, I will counter to that opinion that Brandon gave us by saying that 
there are times that when Ben doesn't have the ball in his hands, he looks lost on the floor like he doesn't know where to go. Part of that may just be the offense itself. Part of that may be just his own, shall I call it stubbornness, when it comes to his place in the offense and on the floor. But ultimately, I have to believe that Ben Simmons is a guy who does not have to be a point guard. This idea that when he came to the NBA, he had to be a point guard was really only a byproduct of Brett Brown and the Sixers' vision for him. It's not like he was playing point guard his entire life or that he was the only ball handler on his team in high school and college. So when you look at Ben Simmons and you realize his height, his athleticism, his ability to get to the rim, he supposedly has a high basketball IQ, right? We've heard that probably 200 times. So why can't we have another ball handler out there with him? And don't tell me it's Josh Richardson. Josh Richardson is a slightly better ball handler than Aaron McKee was when he was on the Sixers winning the sixth man of the year with Iverson. Because remember there were times when the Sixers, if Eric Snow went to the bench, McKee would be a ball handler. Josh Richardson is a very similar guy. He's not really a ball handler. He's not really a point guard, but he gets the job done more often than not. But it's not his primary skill set. It's not his primary strength. If we changed Ben Simmons' role in the offense, if we didn't put as much pressure on him to be the distributor and the guy running the offense, you have to wonder... At what point would Ben's game actually expand and open him up to new opportunities? I think there's a beautiful opportunity if the Sixers got a real, legitimate other guard next to Ben and kicked him down to that point forward role. Because we know Ben can, is a triple-double machine. We know he can get assists, especially in fast breaks. We know he can get rebounds. Listen, one of the reasons why Magic Johnson had the assist that he did was, one, because he had great teammates to pass to, and two, you go back and watch those Laker games. They were running as often as possible. It's not like they were running half-court offense every time down the floor. If there was a rebound, there was usually an outlet pass, and then either Magic or Michael Cooper or Byron Scott would catch it and get it back to Magic and he would either finish the play or dish it to somebody else to finish on the fast break. Ben Simmons is more than capable of doing that kind of offense. Ben Simmons is also more than capable of doing what Scottie Pippen and Grant Hill did, which is let the offense reset, evaluate the floor, be an inside-outside guy when it comes to the ball handling, and play off of another ball handler if necessary. This idea that Ben Simmons couldn't play with Jimmy Butler, I think is ridiculous. The Sixers got to the seventh game of that series against the Raptors, and as many of you like to text in here at 609-403-0973, the Sixers were a couple bounces away from potentially going to the conference finals. But as Brandon Robinson said, that was last year. And the more I think about what he said, the more I have to agree. I think last year's Sixers team was a better team. I think last year's Sixers team with Jimmy Butler and J.J. Redick were more well-equipped to win a championship than the current roster. And I understand that you have a lot of talent on this roster. And you can Text in at 609-403-0973 and tell me I'm wrong. But I think that this team is going to have more questions and answers when they return to the floor. You go this long without practicing with each other, this long without having that chemistry, this long without having 
the feel of the game, the court of awareness. A lot of guys, they play in practice and scrimmage with their friends and workout partners throughout the summer. They're not going multiple months without having any basketball. This is a situation that we've never seen before. So for some of these guys, this might be like hitting a reset button basketball-wise. One of the reasons why the Sixers took so long to bring back Simmons and Embiid from their injuries wasn't just because they had interests in their longevity of their health or in the interest of protecting them from themselves or the interest of trying to get a better lottery pick, but also because there's an understanding that if you haven't played basketball, that the first few times you're on the court, you might not have the best feel for it. We all saw in the Jordan documentary that there were games when Jordan came back wearing that 45 that he wasn't Jordan. He didn't have the full length. He wasn't fully there. He hadn't been playing basketball. He was out of rhythm. He didn't have the full access to his abilities because he hadn't been using them for so long. So when you look at a guy like Ben Simmons, and now you're coming off all this time where he's supposedly recovering from an injury, which I, I think he, at this point he should be recovered from, although backs are always a, a finicky thing, you have to ask the question, are we going to get the best version of Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Tobias Harris, Al Horford, etc.? And if we don't get the best version of those guys coming back from this two-month hiatus to start playing games at the end of July, we could have some serious problems when this team does get to the postseason. Because you have an eight-game window to shuffle around the standings. You have an eight-game window to try to recalibrate your path to the NBA Finals. Because right now, you would play the Celtics. Are you okay with the Celtics? Or do you maybe want to get the Pacers instead? Are you trying to avoid the heat? Do you maybe not want to be a certain seed because you don't want the Bucks in the second round and you'd rather play the Raptors? And then you have that strategy, but then can you execute it on the floor? Everyone asks Ben Simmons to shoot jump shots, right? Well, how does not playing basketball for two plus months help your jump shot? Probably not much. <laughs> Probably not much at all. Embiid hasn't been out there. What's his cardio like? What's his conditioning like? I mean, I, I just, I don't have this vision of Embiid running up and down hills like Jerry Rice in the offseason. I think Embiid stays in shape like most athletes do, but I don't think he's, you know, doing crazy stuff because, one, he's a seven-foot-tall guy, and there's not a lot of places for a seven-foot-tall guy to go to. And number two, there's only so much Peloton biking you can ride. Let's be realistic. <laughs> but I want to hear from you guys. 609-403-0973 is text for reminder coming up at 125. Brian Toporek, Bleach Report, the NBA pod, right here on the warm-up on 97.3 ESPN-FM. Again, text board is open, 609-403-0973. Tom from the Villas Chimes in and says, if Simmons is going to play off the ball, should he develop a jump shot? Well, Tom, we know he has a jump shot. We've all seen the videos of him in those summer pickup games. We've all seen video of him or been in person at games and seen him draining threes, draining jump shots before the game. With Ben, it's less about developing a jump shot, but it's the willingness to shoot that jump shot. Is he willing, if he plays off the ball, to accept that role of being a more mentally more of a scorer instead of just a distributor? You know, one of the things LeBron James had to learn in his career was to take control at the end of the game in fourth quarters when your team needs you to score. And one of the problems he had that first year in Miami was there was that whole question, well, whose team is it? Is it Dwayne? Is it LeBron? Who should be taking the final shot at the end of the shot clock, at the end of the quarter, at the end of a game? There was a lot of confusion about 
who should be doing it. And part of the reason why the Heat won that championship over the OKC Thunder, because that postseason, he finally took the reins of that team and said, if my team needs me to step up and be the scorer, to be the catalyst, then I'm going to do it. He was pushed to get the job done. But he had to be pushed there. It didn't come naturally to him. There were even times in Cleveland where he was passing the guys like Mo Williams and, and uh, Daniel Gibson for you know shot clock, end of game type scenarios, jump shots. That's what we're talking about here. Even LeBron was passing the ball off. So if that's part of Ben Simmons' problem, that he has this mentality he doesn't want to take the shot because he has to set other teammates up and pass the ball. Maybe, just maybe, and I'm not saying this is the truth, Tom. I'm just putting out a scenario that maybe if he played off the ball more and he was asked to be focused a little bit more on scoring than distributing, maybe that would help him have that willingness to shoot the ball a little more often. Maybe. Can't promise anything. 609-403-0973. Dan from EHT chimes in and says, I think a lot of us have forgotten about Shake Milton. He was progressing when Ben was out. Here's the problem I have with Shake Milton. I don't think Shake Milton is a bona fide NBA starter at this point in his career. I don't think he's a guy that you want out there consistently in big game situations. because I don't think he has that maturity and experience and skill set development yet. I think he did show a lot when Ben was out. He showed a willingness to score, a willingness to shoot when his team needed him to. But if you have him out there, let's say the lineup is um, Embiid, Simmons, Harris, Richardson, and Shake Milton, right? Well, if you're asking Shake and Ben to share the ball handling duties and you're asking Ben to score... Is Richardson basically just a glorified spacing shooter? Because if that's the case, why didn't you just keep J.J. Redick, you know, for that role? Or, you know, maybe Richardson has a lesser role in the offense, and maybe you ask Matisse Thibel to play some minutes. I know Hunter Brody mentioned that yesterday on the Sports Bash about, you know, maybe getting Matisse more minutes if you had Shake on the floor. But as Mike Gill said yesterday on 97.3 ESPN, listen, and I agree with him, the Slider brothers haven't played together, so how are we supposed to know if they're even going to be good? I, I think that one of the reasons why I forget about Shake, Dan, from EHT, is be, not because he can't play, but because I don't know yet if his skill set blends well with Ben. Milton and Sivens out there on the court together, we haven't seen that yet. So we don't know if that's going to work or not. So for me, at least, it's less about forgetting about Shake, but it's the fact that when I look at this team from last year to this year, as Brandon Robinson said the other day, when you had a team out there with Butler and Redick next to Tobias, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, that was a better starting lineup than Shake Milton, Josh Richardson, Tobias Harris, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, or whatever version of that lineup you want to have, whether it's Matisse Stiebel instead of Josh Richardson or whether it's, you know, put Horford in and Simmons guess a big three and the bias is a big two. I mean, it's it, the, the team as constructed is just not the best roster structure for some of the stuff that we're talking about when it comes to floor spacing. 609-403-0973. Texter chimes in and says, I don't even want to imagine how lazy Embiid is coming back. He's probably over 25 pounds overweight. I don't know if he is or not. Listen, I I never assume athletes are lazy because I've seen Joel in his workout videos over the summers and what he does in his training and stuff. The dude puts in work. I don't think it's less about Embiid being lazy. I just think that one of the problems for Joel is there 
there's a desire of the people who work with him, whether it's his personal training people, his personal company he keeps, or his Sixers training staff, to not let him overdo it. There's a lot of times they have to protect him from himself when it comes to his minutes, whether it comes to his health, whether it comes to him pushing himself so far. I don't really think Embiid is lazy. I think that's a poor mentality people have of him because sometimes he has you know, body posture and uh, an attitude at times that he doesn't care. Embiid is a, is a competitor. Embiid wants to go out there and be the best he can be. I don't think he's lazy at all. I think that he may have had some issues when it comes to dietary restrictions in the past. I think there have been times that Joel Embiid has not been very responsible with his overall health. But I at all do not think that he's lazy. I think that's a very unfair misconception. I think that some of his conditioning and health issues have been more so a byproduct of things such as his injuries and his inability to work out when he is injured. Uh, you know, maybe he hasn't always had the best diet. Maybe he hasn't always the best workout regimen. And no athlete having the access to the normal facilities and workout systems, anybody could be potentially overcoming overweight or out of shape. I don't think it's a hundred percent fair. I think that, you know, someone like Joel, I think he does have a desire to be in shape and be great. You know, he may not just be in basketball shape. He may be in, I've been working out in the gym and riding the Peloton bike shape. And I keep saying Peloton, but I, I don't know if you all saw this, but over the weekend on TV, I was flipping the channel, and there was a, a Peloton competition between athletes and celebrities where they were all on these screens like uh, Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch for you, those of you older folk. And, you know, there are all these guys and all these men and women in these squares competing in this in this biking race. And I'm like, when did this become like the thing that everybody does to stay in shape? Like, I understand people were stuck in their houses, but, you know, there are other home workouts that are not riding an exercise bike. I'm just saying. Like, we act like that's the only home workout program. Like, yet apparently everybody in the world that's the thing to do. That's the trendy thing to do. I'm like, I'm sorry. Is that the only idea you had to stay in shape at home? Like, I'm sure there are other programs out there that don't involve buying a bike with a screen in front of it with someone telling you how fast or slow to ride. I'm just saying. All right. Got to get a break. Coming up next. I, I promise. I'll get back to basketball. Brian Toporek joining us next Bleacher Report NBA podcast joins us next here on 97.3 ESPN as the NBA looks like they're going to approve the 22-team plan. It looks like we're going to have basketball. So what is that basketball going to even look like, though? We'll get into all that more with Brian coming up next on 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. Welcome back to the warm-up here on 97.3 ESPN. We'll get back to your text in just a bit at 609 609- 4030973. But right now, as promised, joining us on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline, quality editor for Bleach Report, co host of the NBA pod. He is Brian Sporek. And as all guests, he joins us here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Brian, I know we got a lot to get into, but I know you wanted to, you know, touch on what's going on in the world first before we, you know, get into the nuts and bolts of what's going on with the NBA. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Josh. I just wanted to say, you know, it's it, feels weird and you know kind of insignificant to be talking about the nba right now given all that's going on so before we get into that i just want to say my heart goes out to the families of george floyd ahmaud arbery brianna taylor and anyone else who's hurting right now around the world um i I just think it's on all of us to do better and i think we can and we will uh but it's going to take some commitment from everyone yeah, and it's not something that's going to happen overnight because let's be realistic, you know, Rome wasn't built in the day and, and neither was all the problems in the world as well. Right, right, exactly. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to see that so many people are coming out and especially in the NBA. I mean, thank God we do not have anyone like Drew Brees that we need to talk about today. Uh, I'm proud as an NBA fan and someone who covers the league to see how outspoken all the players have been and like big name players too. I mean, LeBron James, you know, came out and 
had some strong uh, sentiment after Drew Brees' comment. And since we're we're talking about the Sixers here, Tobias Harris, if you guys haven't read it, wrote a really powerful piece on the Players' Tribune yesterday. I would encourage everyone to go check that out as well. Yeah, and we talked about this a couple days ago here on 97.3 ESPN, Brian. Before we get to the other stuff, you know, the NBA has a history of players speaking out on different issues. And this is not a, a, a league of people who have just shown up recently to stand up for the right thing or to speak out. That The NBA has been enabling their players and allowing them to do stuff like this for a long time. So this is just something that just happened just in the last several days. There have been players who have been speaking out and standing up for the right thing for many decades now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not just like empty PR, hollow statements. You know, the, these matters are important to the players. I mean, this is a majority black league. So this is a reality that and Tobias even talked about it in his piece. Like, you know, he's Tobias Harris, Philadelphia 76, or play at Tennessee, all these great things. But you know, if he gets pulled over on the side of the road on a Saturday night, he's, he's just a six foot nine black man. And it, it's terrifying. So, again, we all we all need to do better. Speaking of Tobias, one of the things I opened the show with today, Brian, talking about is the fact that we really don't know what these teams are going to look like coming out of this layoff. You know, a lot of time when guys have an off season, whether they go deep in the playoffs or not, they're still scrimmaging with workout partners or other NBA players. They're still running up and down courts, working out. These past two months, players, most of them haven't even been shooting baskets. They haven't been working out in the traditional basketball manner. So, you know, what can we even expect from the players when they do get to the point of resuming these games at the end of July? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest questions hanging over the season is what do the players look like? What do the teams look like? I mean, you know, some teams have been, I think most teams at this point are allowed to do individual workouts in their own facilities. Um, It sounds like, at least tentatively, the plan is for them to all come back for a training camp in early July at their own site, and then they'll all head to Orlando uh, and do another sort of a bridge training camp there while they're quarantined. So they'll have, you know, give or take a couple weeks, maybe even a full month of being back with the full team before we get into game action. Um, But Derek Bodner of The Athletic noted this the other day. The Sixers, right before the season uh, went on hiatus, Al Horford temporarily got benched, and then Ben Simmons has the back injury. He's out after the All-Star break. Horford goes back into the starting lineup. Shake Milton comes in the starting lineup in place of Simmons, plays really well. The, The four minus Horford plus Milton starting lineup, so Milton, Simmons, Embiid, Josh Richardson, Tobias Harris, has not played a single minute together this season. I just looked this up as well. Milton's only played, I think, 113 minutes with Embiid and Simmons together. So if the plan is to keep Milton in the starting lineup, which I think makes sense for a lot of reasons, you break up the Horford, Embiid, Simmons awkward fit, you let Simmons operate off the ball more, because uh, Alec Burks can operate as a backup point guard as well. I, I, I think that's the way to go, but now they're only going to have eight regular season games to really test this out and get comfortable with it before the playoffs begin. And, and even that is not even really a test, because to me, those eight games have, have a dual purpose. To me, those eight games are, one, an opportunity for different teams to move up and down playoff seating, but number two it's basically just you to get back at the basketball speed. So, you know, how much time do you really have to experiment with different lineups, considering the fact that Simmons is coming off an injury? None of these players have even shot any hoops together for two-plus months. And let's not overlook the fact that you're going to be playing these games on a neutral site, and no matter if they bring in courts or not, Brian, you know, this idea Mm -hmm. that bringing the home courts to Orlando— it doesn't oh, yeah. matter. It, it's still not the same environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, those are all fair points. I'm I'm almost wondering at this point, and I've got a piece, whenever this proposal actually gets approved, I'll publish it at Forbes today. I'm wondering if it almost behooves the Sixers to stay at the six seed. Because if they do, yeah, they'll probably draw Boston in the first round. Boston has a two-and-a-half game lead over Miami for the number three. But that means they avoid the Bucks until the conference finals if they 
can beat Boston and get to the second round. You get Toronto instead of Boston in all likelihood. Or sorry, Toronto instead of Milwaukee in all likelihood. And if we're judging this team and this season based on how far they can go, I think their odds of getting to the conference finals are higher if they stay at number six. That isn't even to mention, you know, they have this top 20 protected uh, pick from the Oklahoma City Thunder owed to them as well. And it's currently unclear whether these eight regular season games are going to affect the draft standings at all um, or whether they're just going to freeze the standings as of where the regular season stops. But if they do, the Sixers are only a game and a half behind the Thunder. So we might get to a point toward the end of this, you know, shortened regular season where it behooves them to lose because if they win, they would end up costing themselves a first-round pick. So they're going to have a lot of competing interests to juggle as they you know, resume play at the end of July here. If I could just throw a wrench into everything you just said, there's another variable that goes into, which is the Celtics are three, guy, three games behind the Raptors. What if the Celtics mm-hmm. come out and go 8-0 in this thing and they move up to the two seed, then your desire to play the Celtics in the first round might not be there depending on who moves up and down. Yeah, right. I mean, we'll just kind of have to see how the seeding plays out. I think it's pretty safe to say Milwaukee's more or less locked into that number one. Right. And then, you know, the, some combination of the Nets, Magic, and Wizards will be the 7-8. We don't know who that will be, but it shouldn't affect the Sixers either way because I don't think it's realistic that the Sixers fall below the six. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's just worth – seeing all these variables play out, but it would not surprise me, um, you know, given the possibility of seeing Milwaukee in the second round, given the OKC pick implications, it wouldn't totally shock me if the Sixers did approach this shortened regular season more willing to experiment than some of the other teams. Brian Toporek joining us on the Boardwalk kind of Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. You mentioned the other teams. Let's start with the Eastern Conference. Only one other extra team coming. That is the Wizards. My biggest question is this. I don't even know if we have an answer to this. So are the Wizards coming back with with or without John Wall? So Fred Katz of The Athletic reported yesterday that they the Wizards see no reason to bring John Wall back. Basically, it's a long shot that they could even force a play-in tournament. They're five and a half games behind the Magic right now and six behind the Nets. So they would have to gain two games on one of those teams to force a play-in tournament. They would have to win both games in the play-in tournament, and then they would still just be roadkill for the Bucks in the first round of the playoffs. So they're thinking, you know, sure, John Wall is probably healthy enough to play right now. He was scrimmaging back in March with their G League team. Like, I, I think health-wise, he could go, but do you risk that? and risk him getting re-injured for the slight possibility of a first-round playoff burst? Probably not. So it, I think it's basically going to be the Bradley Beal and Davis Breton show for Washington. So then my next question would be with the Wizards, it, was it basically just including them a formality to say, look, we included an extra Eastern Conference team? And how much of it has to do with the fact of, for example, Washington's a big market. So you know, you have regional network agreements, you have advertising agreements, and they get more eyeballs onto this. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it was kind of an arbitrary cutoff. Uh, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN has been reporting that they, the NBA basically looked at historical precedent, where we are when the season stopped. You know, every team had somewhere around 15 to 18 games left to play. So teams have made up a six-game deficit at that point. So they said, okay, that's the cutoff. Any team within six games of a playoff spot, you're coming. So that includes the Wizards, who are five and a half back, and the Phoenix Suns, who are six back. Everyone else, sorry, go home. You're done for the year. I mean, they had to cut it off at some number. I I just feel like, Brian, and I know the league will never admit this, so we're we're never going to get some true answer on this, but so much of this to me came down to the fact of, one, Zion Williamson, and Mm -hmm. two, the fact that, the league knows that they couldn't just eliminate everything that happened in the regular season. And with so many guys like, you know, the Dame Lillards of the world, other players saying, I want to come back and compete. It felt like the league had to try to open up to as many viable teams as possible. 
without also compromising the entire validity of a regular season that was played all the way up to March 11th. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the NBA had to juggle a bunch of competing interests here. Um, They would never admit this, but, I mean, ultimately, the whole thing is just a money grab, right? Like, if you're looking at it from a health perspective, you would not bring back 22 teams. You would bring back 16. You would keep the East and the West separate to limit the potential of a massive outbreak. The 22 is just, okay, we need, you know, these six teams needed X number of games to satisfy their regional sports network contract. Great. That's more money coming in. Fine. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think 30 teams, that was a a potential, um, you know, possibility when it was just like, okay, we can have every team satisfy their contract, but that quickly got ruled out. 16 got ruled out as well. Just start the playoffs right when we get there because the players said, you know, we need time to get back into game shape. So, um, you know, the the 22 became probably the best middle ground there, but Dame Lillard went to Chris Haynes of Yahoo Sports and said, hey, like, I'll go to Orlando, but if I have nothing to play for, I'm not playing. I'm not risking myself. So the NBA had to find the middle ground there as well, saying, okay, we're bringing back these six teams that currently aren't in the playoffs, but we have to give them some chance to get in as remote as it might be. So they came up with you know, this whole play-in tournament with your, your, within four games. The nine seed is within four games by the time the season ends. There'll be a play-in tournament. I actually like the structure where – you know, the eight seed is rewarded is so that nine seed has to win two games against the eight seed, but the eight seed clinches with just one win. I think that's fair. I think it's the number eight seed should have an advantage in that regard. Um, I think it's very possible that we do have a play in tournament for that number eight seed. And, you know, the NBA has been toying around with this idea even prior to the pandemic. So this is kind of the best excuse to try it out. The season is already so unique given the circumstances you might as well experiment and see how it works and if if this you know takes hold and if this is actually adds excitement if ratings go off the roof maybe it becomes a permanent change brian you mentioned the financial aspect of it touch on a little bit about the fact you know we see guys like jared dudley and chris paul putting out there that like you know you know, we need to play because you know the financial stability of the league is at stake and the future of the league this isn't just, you know, like in baseball, the owners are crying poor. Like these are players coming out and talking about money. So, you know, what is the financial implications of them having to come back versus them just vacating the season? Yeah. So the NBA has the right in the collective bargaining agreement. If a game gets canceled for some reason, such as a pandemic, that is one of the reasons included. Uh, the NBA has the ability to opt out of the entire collecting bargaining agreement. They have pushed that opt out deadline back until September. So there is no indication that they're going to do it or that they're seriously considering it right now. But the fact that, I mean, that, that deadline would have already expired otherwise. So they're keeping that card on the table, at least as kind of like the nuclear option of if we can't come to terms moving forward, this is a possibility. And Adam Silver in his call with players earlier this month said this current CBA was not built for an extended pandemic. This is that quote was from Adrian Wojnarowski. Um, You know, they're talking already about, we don't know if we're going to have fans in stadiums next year. We're definitely not going to have them in Orlando. Fans apparently comprised 40% of the league's revenue just based on attendance, you know, ticket sales, concessions, parking, all that good stuff. So that's a lot of money. It's going out the window definitely for the rest of this year and possibly next season as well. Um, the players are owed a certain percentage of the revenue that's coming in, and they've all signed contracts that's based on that amount of revenue. But if the revenue falls by 40%, suddenly they'll be getting a lot more than they're allowed to via the collective bargaining agreement. So this is all stuff that the NBA and the Players Association will need to bargain over the coming weeks and months. I think the fact that uh, we've seen progress in an agreement this season is encouraging. The Players Union has already agreed to put a higher percentage of the player's salary in escrow this season, which will help cover 
some of the shortfall from this year. So I think there there are signs for optimism. It's not like MLB where the two sides are just totally, you know, completely uh, diametrically opposed at this point. I think they will find a common ground, hopefully, but there's a lot of money at stake, and it's going to mean some pretty substantial changes to the way things work, not just for this season, but at least for next season as well and possibly the years after that. Brian, before I let you go, and I'm reserving the right for you to change your mind on this opinion, but as of <laughs> June 4th, 2020, give me a team that you would think will be the, the biggest disadvantage and the biggest advantage coming into this neutral site, potential playoff format, race to the championship. I mean, the Sixers might be one of the most disadvantaged teams just from the perspective of they were so good at home. They were 29-2 and two at home, and they were 10-24 and 24 on the road this year, which was the worst record of any team currently in the playoffs. These aren't technically road games because there aren't going to be fans in the stands, but, I mean, they clearly feed off the energy at home. I don't think you can't explain away that home road split any other way. So I think that's going to hurt them. Um, in terms of teams that will help, I think you know any team that's still in the playoff hunt, the Trailblazers and Pelicans in particular, you know they're three and a half games behind the Memphis Grizzlies for the number eight seed right now. So one of them will have a realistic shot of actually forcing this play-in tournament. The Blazers in particular, you know Yusuf Nurkic was getting ready to come back when the season shut down. Zach Collins is also going to be back, uh, according to Damian Lillard. So they're going to be much healthier than they've been all year. So I, I actually think the Blazers have a real shot of making the playoffs, which I would not have said, you know, in mid, the middle of March. Yeah, can you imagine a scenario where the Lakers and Blazers go a full seven games in the first round and it comes down to a tie game and Dame Lillard has the ball with 10 seconds? Wouldn't that be juicy? Oh, that would be that would be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, the Blazers have the size, you know, with Collins, Nurkic, Hassan Whiteside, they have the size to actually match up pretty well against the Lakers. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's just nice to even talk a little bit of basketball despite everything that's going on in the world. And, Brian, I appreciate you jumping on. Bleacher Report, don't forget about the NBA podcast that he co-hosts. Also, Forbes Sports is all guests he appeared on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Brian, thanks again for the time. Always, Josh. Thank you. Josh Hennick here on 97.3 ESP. And we'll get back to your text coming up next. 609-403-0973 here on 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Sea Isle City. Final segment here on the warm-up 97.3 ESPN. Get your text in just a moment at 609-403-097. A couple of news items to touch on here. Uh, non-basketball news. You go to 97.3ESPN.com or just pull up your 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. The Arena Football League is having an auction to sell off the assets. That includes the assets for the Atlantic City Blackjack and Philadelphia the Soul will be available for bidding. It can be purchased as part of the bankruptcy proceedings. So that should be an interesting conversation when that comes around. First of all, who has the money to buy any of those assets? Considering, what, 20 million Americans are out of work? And uh, second of all, are any of those assets even worth having? Just saying. Uh, also, another bit of news coming out from Adrian Wojnarowski. A Woj bomb dropped. Um, the NBA has set August 25th as the new draft lottery. And October 15th will be the 2020 NBA draft. Now, for reference purposes, October 15th is a Thursday night, which means the NBA draft is scheduled to go head to head with Thursday night football, which will be airing on Fox and NFL Network. So the NBA draft will be going head to head with Pat Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs versus Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills. I am so curious to find out what is going to be more watched. 
Are people going to watch Thursday Night Football or an NBA draft? It's a Thursday night game that has Pat Mahomes, but it's against the Bills in Buffalo. NBA draft, Thursday night football. I'm sure that's the topic that Mike Gill and Hunter Brody will be talking about coming up on the warm-up on 97.3 ESPN. Back to your text, 609-403-0973. I want to get to this text from John in Collingswood because he brings up some very interesting points. He says, I'm really not too concerned about what kind of shape the players are in when they're coming back. I'm just really missing basketball, and I'm willing to put up with whatever product they put out for me. I'm sure there are others who feel the same way. What is your take on it? Are you happy? He's asking me, are you happy with any of the basketball? Or would you be happier if they came back in just really good shape? That's from John in Collingswood. John, first of all, I'm like you. I'm happy with whatever they can do. And one of the reasons why I'm happy with whatever they can do is because the players are behind this. Whether it's Dame Lillard, Patrick Beverly, Chris Paul, LeBron James, Jared Dudley, Tobias Harris, all of these players who have come out and said that they want to play, they want to resume the season, they want to take their chance at you know competing and winning a title. And because of the communication from the NBA to them about the health procedures and the safety protocols and everything that goes into it, they seem to be okay with coming back. And they feel that it's important that they come back, they have a chance to compete, and if the players are okay with it, and the players are all right with everything that goes into this, then guess what? I'm okay with it, and I'm looking forward to it, and I'm good with it. Because to me, I, I think if the players are all right with everything that goes into it, I'm okay with it. I think one of the problems that we have with baseball right now is because the players and the owners don't trust each other. There's no agreement. There's no consensus on what is going on at all. Whereas the NBA and the NHL have a completely different situation between the players and the league owners. So I'm I'm looking forward to it, not just because I miss basketball, but because of the fact that the players are on board. I'm telling you folks, mark that calendar. October 15th, NBA draft versus Pat Mahomes. Be there. <laughs> 